Hey everybody and welcome back to Humankind, a game that has, let's be real, changed a heck of a lot over the last year since its release. And today, I'm going to share some basic tips that will turn beginners into pros. Without any further ado, with time cards below as well, let's like the video and begin. And rightfully, we start in the Neolithic era as a nomadic tribe. Here, I want to teach you the fundamentals for how you navigate this era, because it is so important that you do it right. If you don't start right, you will not have a successful game, probably. So first and foremost, make sure you pay attention to your tiles. Moving through forested tile like this, which I hover over and I can see it's forest, uses two base movement points, whereas moving across a normal tile only uses one. So moving through dense forest like I am right now, really bad idea. What we should be doing is moving along rivers, where we're more likely to find better food discoveries, right? So it's not only about saving our movement points, but also it's about ensuring that we find the best food we can. So this discovery here is is likely to net me at least five additional food more than a food discovery, say, just placed on, I don't know, this random prairie here, for example. Prairie, what a brilliant word. Um, anyway, that is really fundamental to how you navigate the Neolithic era. There is one other thing you should consider as well, though, and I've started to make move towards it here. Can anybody quickly guess? I'll give you a minute to comment below. I won't actually, you'll have to pause. Would Definitely not going to sit around here for a f***ing minute. Uh, anyway, uh, move to high ground is the other thing that you need to remember about navigating terrain. This, of course, by the way, doesn't just apply to the Neolithic era, right? This applies always. If you're navigating troops, moving armies across the land to, say, fight someone over here or what have you, you're going to need to remember how to save your movement points. So while I said at the start that this is all about the, the sort of Neolithic era, actually, no, you can use this right the way through, baby. And of course, as a slight bonus tip here, don't forget to separate your tribes almost immediately. Um, unless you're fighting a mammoth, you might want to keep two dudes together. But otherwise, you should absolutely be separating these dudes and spreading them out to see what you can find. Uh, one final point to note, and this is kind of a, a slightly more advanced one, but seeing as we've covered everything else, we may as well cover this here too. Stepping onto a river the first time you do it, you'll see if I hold down right click, it brings up this sort of like wavy lines and an arrow pointing to the left. Um, I'm not sure why the, I don't know what that arrow is meant to mean. Maybe it's like resistance coming against us. I'm not sure. But either way, you'll see that down the bottom left, it says movement points to enter, all remaining. Movement points to follow, one. However, as I enter in, I'll use them all. So basically what that means is as soon as I step onto a river, this unit's turn is over. So watch, if I'm moving this way, I can take two tiles, but as soon as I try and step onto a river, nah, I can literally just step once. So the tip here is fairly simple. If you can, try and make it like this, where you only have one movement point left, and then you're not wasting any moves as you step up onto a river against a mammoth that you probably will lose to because you separated your dudes. But it'll be worth it, trust me, because now you've mounted two rivers, you're moving through to the next turn, and as we talked about earlier, these food discoveries, this freshwater harvest, is netting me 15 food. And on a normal game speed, that's almost enough to get an additional unit grab them because they will have full movement points and spread them out. And you can kind of try and sort of daisy chain it from there. Starting, of course, in the Neolithic era, but running through the entire game. The other relatively basic thing that you're going to want to master or remember if you're already a pro watching this, but maybe you just wanted a, a quick reminder or brush up, is your basic combat skills. So we'll look board here and use this poor peaceful mammoth uh, as a case study, effectively, and delve in. Let's step to the high ground, which will of course provide us with an advantage, and enter in the manual battle, right? So firstly, we can choose where we deploy our units. Generally speaking, you're going to want to grab the high ground, and you're going to want to stay away from water hazards. Don't go into the ocean. Look, you weren't born a boat. Don't go into the ocean. And secondly, stay off the rivers as well. And then you're just looking for high ground and crucially, a high ground position where your opponent is forced to take the low ground. So while this, this here is fine, a better deploy could be 
to step this unit up to the high ground. That way we ensure that the mammoth stays down on these slightly lower tiles, one, two, three, four, running around like this, and we have the high ground. So let's end our deployment there on the high ground and see what this guy will do. Okay, so he spawned quite low down. This is okay though. We can just mimic the strategy. <laughs> we could go down onto his level and stab him, or we could stick to our high ground. Because again, high ground is relative. So long as we're at least one step up above, we've still got the high ground. Okay, neat. So you see, we took 14 and the mammoth took 30. That is absolutely thanks to the high ground. And to prove it, I'll bring this unit down onto sort of uh, flat footing. And you can see that even though actually this unit is a bit damaged, right? Its combat strength is now a bit lower. We are getting a plus one buff from a friendly unit as well. So don't forget to hover over like this. Have a look at that attack prediction and see what kind of interactions are playing out. Certain units may have special abilities or promotions that give even more uh, bonuses to high ground, low ground, being in a forested tile, or potentially being surrounded by like-for-like -like units. As I stab in here, you can see that it was almost reversed. I took a whopping 30 damage and the mammoth was like, I don't care, and took literally just nine. Watch now as I stab at it from the high ground. Hopefully we'll do slightly better. Yes, a much more even attack. The other thing you can do in a position like this is grab your high ground and don't stab into them. Instead, take this defensive position. If you end your turn without attacking or end your round, as it were, you can grab the defensive stance. This will ensure that you take less damage and in turn deliver more to them. And you can see in that case, it was enough to win the fight. We also, because the mammoths are so juicy to take down, came away with 20 food, which, as you may know, on a normal game pacing, is enough to get an additional unit and 20 influence, which is, of course, a very vital currency if we were to say, grab these guys and want to place down an outpost to claim a territory. And that is fundamentally all you'll need to know to handle land combat, and to a certain extent actually naval combat as well. Uh, the only things that will differ will be much later in the game where sort of bombs and planes and stuff start coming in, and things get a little bit more complicated. The other thing to note, of course, is that we didn't use ranged units, who at the moment have a somewhat confusing line of sight uh, interaction, which can be a little bit uh, difficult to understand. That is being updated in a future patch though, so I won't delve into that too much here right now. Other than to note that ranged units do have a very impressive range in humankind, so keep them on high ground and keep them sort of two to three tiles away unless they're crossbowmen. And now I'd like to tackle the different types of cultures in humankind. Not necessarily a basic overview of me sitting here and saying, look, you can mouse over the expansionist and see what they do, how they do it. But more importantly, the relative power of these, because uh, not only is that important to know at every single era when you're choosing how to play or adapt to how your opponents are playing, but also it's changed a lot. So it's a constantly evolving process within your game, but also because humankind is constantly evolving, it's even more complicated. Uh, what you need to know essentially is what are the best ones, what are the worst ones, what tend to be more powerful or less. And I thought that the ancient era would be a good position for us to grab because it's very easy for me to go through and say, if you just want some bare bones, basic ass recommendations, the Egyptians as a builder are still very good. The Harappans who love food to grow population are still very good. However, some new contenders have entered. Actually, a lot of them. This is a, probably a whole separate video for those of us who have played humankind a bit more or maybe those who just want a little bit more detail. But the key thing to note is that militarist cultures these days are very good. The Mycenaeans, in fact, had to be nerfed a little bit. They were that good. <laughs> and also, there is one other very basic and hidden gem now in humankind, and it's the Aesthetic cultures. And the me of a year ago, <laughs> or 11 months ago, I guess, really didn't think that he would be saying that. <laughs> But my God, are they fantastic. Joe, yes, Olmec gang. Let's have a look at the Olmecs as our case study and move through. Of course, in a normal game, you wouldn't have moved through right now. 
And as the regular viewer who tunes into the Humankind live streams or who has watched the Humankind videos before would know, it's because I haven't got my Knowledge Star. So here's a little bonus tip for you. Make sure you get your Knowledge Star. It'll give you a special event, right? Make sure you gather these curiosities to get some science. Get your 10 out of 10. And then when you get the special event, choose the science one because it's the best. Plus one science per population. Yeah, baby. Anyway, let's move through because there are a few special extra special things about aesthetic cultures in particular that we'll use as a sort of case study to figure out uh, how the meta's changed. And if you're new to humankind, what kind of things you just might want to pick as a general good starting point. In the early game, I found uh, influence and faith to be especially strong. That's not to say that they're not useful later on, but they really are very powerful because you can quickly over uh, sort of overlap or I guess overtake is a better way of putting it. Uh, you can quickly overtake your opponent and then just keep drowning them out for the rest of the game, right? You quickly overwhelm their faith and then you just sort of keep yours level with theirs and you'll keep control of them. Likewise with your cultural influences. So let's jump in, grab this as a city. Fantastic. Up here in the top left, we have our unique ability. For builders, it'll turn their science and money into industry, right? For the militarists, it'll convert their population into units. For us, we can use territorial blitz. Well, it's 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 a cultural blitz, actually. Um, but that's fine. Either way, this is an incredibly powerful ability. As you move through the game and have more empires and cultures bordering you, it becomes much, much stronger. I have seen this thing net an insane, insane amount of influence. And I'm so glad because for a long time, it was relatively weak in humankind. So to summarize here, you really need to pay attention to a few things. Builder cultures, food cultures, to get your basics set up, your industry to build things faster and your food to grow people so that they can fill these jobs up here and provide all sorts of yield. Very useful for you throughout the entire game. But in the new, changed and evolving humankind, it's simply not that straightforward. Uh, as we know, populations, here are some scouts within my borders. If I click this button here, disband unit, okay. It'll convert it into a population in the city. You can see San Lorenzo now has one. If I do it again here, see a scout, you're being retired and being turned into a farmer. Congratulations. Let's move them over. They are a farmer. Uh, now we're producing people faster to fill more jobs and we've shifted population. Now militarists can do that on command by clicking this button. They can poop out four population as units and do whatever they please. Take cities, transfer them, whatever. The other thing of course to note is that a very powerful aesthetic culture like mine can generate an incredible amount of influence. This is more notable later in the game, but even early in the game actually it's quite useful using our new powerful ability too. Here's a fairly wholesome early game example. So I can use my ability now that I have 30 gold. I can pick a territory, but unfortunately in this case we're not yet bordering, and so it'll only actually generate me 15 influence. However, actually, to be fair, even at this early stage, that would be enough to just tip me over the edge to be able to claim another territory and then lather, rinse and repeat. But let's just save it just for maybe one or two more turns and I'll show you how it could be used a little more usefully. Okay, so a few turns later, I'm going to attach this territory up to my city, which now has two, which is much better than one. And you can see we're starting to border an enemy. Here is where this gets particularly juicy. Now I have a territory that is mine, but is not under my societal influence. This is a double whammy, by the way. We're going through not only how certain cultures and affinity abilities have changed and how to use them, but we're also going through some really nice strategic work here with how societies and cultures work, which is super interesting uh, and very useful for you to understand this screen. So. Thank me later. Anyway, uh, so here we can see I can spend 30 gold thanks to my AC ability and I'll gain 60 influence. That is an incredible trade-off. A two for one, when at the moment I'm earning roughly one for one per turn. That's a great deal. And I can promise you as the game goes through, these deals get even more profound, even if the territories are already sort of under your control, or maybe just slightly conflicted, you know, mostly under your control, but slightly under theirs. Either way, in this case, 30 bucks, 60 influence, not only does it convert it to my authority, right, my cultural influence, which will exert more pressure on them, start to then weaken their stability, 
could cause a rebellion if they don't get a hold of that, right? There are all sorts of snowballing effects it can have. It can force them to change their civics, change the very nature of their society, that people won't really like that, and their yields might not like it either. So there are a lot of positive benefits to the aesthetic cultural blitz and the aesthetic cultures overall that have not only uh, always been in the game, but have been buffed uh, noticeably. Same goes for the militarists. Actually, really across the board, there's generally not a terrible pick in terms of overall cultural affinity. However, one or two uh, specific cultures may be a little weak around the edges. Either way, I hope that by going through some of these basic learnings in humankind uh, that are in the early game, but really a lot of them are, are transmittable throughout the game, has helped you to transform yourself in some way from a beginner to a pro. If it has, do let me know and I'll catch you in the next one.